up till the age of 14, I hadn't been to school. Oh my goodness, yeah. at all? At all. Zero wow. school. Okay. Uh, zero education. Couldn't read or write. No way. Couldn't spell my name. Yeah. The idea was I would join the monastery and just become a monk and focus in things like uh, farming and mm. uh, looking after uh, animals and stuff like wow. that. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us here at the Phyllis Adventure Summit. This is a podcast where we talk to amazing inspirational leaders from around the world, around their journeys, their career, and their, what their personal summit actually is. Today we're joined by Basil Zocker, who is Director of Engineering at yes. The Hook Group, who has an amazing story that I'm looking forward to uh, hearing today. So welcome, Basil. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Basil, what an amazing personal story into yeah. what is now an amazing career and you know, a leading role in a, in a very large tech business. Mm. You were born in Tanzania, is that right? Yeah, so um, I was born in Tanzania, um, well, it was 1983. My parents migrated to Tanzania. Um, originally, my dad was from South Africa. My mother is from England. The way I had my upbringing was quite different from mm. the rest of the people mm. I knew. Um, one of which, of course, was the, the education, yep. part of the education. Up till the age of 14, I hadn't been to school. Oh my goodness, yeah. at all? At all. Zero wow. school. Okay. Uh, zero education. Couldn't read or write. No way. Couldn't spell my name. Yeah. <gasps> so if someone would write my name, you... I wouldn't be able to tell if it was my name. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was quite close to my religion. I'm, I'm mm. Roman Catholic. Mm. Uh, so I spent quite a lot of time in the in church and uh, I felt, oh, I want to become a priest. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, I looked into the possibility of becoming a priest and one of the criteria is uh, you have to have education, and it's the primary <laughs> education. <laughs> so uh, when it came to primary education, I realized, uh, of course, I hadn't had the opportunity to go to, to the primary yeah. school. Um, so I looked at the opportunity of becoming a monk. Wow. Uh, so okay. joining a monastery and then just becoming a, a monk yeah. uh, without any, any education, without any standard okay. type of, um, you know, people being able to read or write. Um, when I joined, uh, luckily I got into the monastery. And, okay. uh, what Where was I, that? So this is back still back in Tanzania. Oh wow, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the idea was I would join the monastery and just become a monk and focus in things like uh, farming and mm. uh, looking after uh, animals and stuff like wow. that. Yeah, for the rest of my life. Um, so the, the monastery was divided into what we call the um, monks and also be, in the, the, the sort of the, the route where you become a priest. Okay. So something happened where I just end up going into a class where I shouldn't have gone to a class on the first day. So I spent about a month in a class I shouldn't be and as I was there I started picking up how to read and write, teaching myself how to read and write and uh, before they realized I was in the wrong wrong place and they said well because they used to always do exams and it was every other three months four months they would do exams and like well let's wait till the time he comes and we'll just send him back home. <laughs> so three months, fast forward three months, um, did my exams and um, they saw there was a potential. Wow. So I continued and uh, I finished a year. They then realized maybe I can go into a proper secondary school. So had no seven years of uh, standard because in Tanzania you have to spend seven years yeah. doing primary education. That's why yeah. at least we call it. Went into a secondary school, uh, which is now the seminary. For some reason did quite well. Out of a class of 56, uh, first semester was the first one. Don't know how that happened. Wow, okay. Yeah. My so uh, then I moved from one seminary two years later, moved from one seminary to another seminary where um, the other seminary was quite top seminaries in, in Tanzania. Yeah. Um, for the first, qu first quarter, I was the last one. <laughs> um, fast forward two years, I was probably the third one. Yeah. I did my national examination, I was the first in Tanzania in oh, physics. Yes. Oh, wow. And this is where I thought, okay, this is something I need to pursue more. Wow. So long story short, uh, I got into medicine, did medicine one year in South Africa. Then I felt, no, um, medicine is not for me. I'm more into a light tech because most of my friends were doing tech. Yeah. So I got into computer engineering yeah. in, uh, in South Africa, uh, Pretoria University. I did one year in software engineering. And then I got a scholarship to come to Manchester University to continue in my Bachelor of Engineering. Yeah. Did my Bachelor of Engineering, um, worked for a couple of years, did my Master of Engineering, then I joined the Hub Group, just going back to 20, 2012. Wow. Yeah, 2012, joined as a software engineer. Been with the company ever since. Right now I'm a Director of Engineering, looking after probably 40% of tech. 
What an incredible journey. Okay, gosh. I don't know if it's incredible. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? <laughs> so, well, at least it's a summary of my life. Yeah, yeah. The monastery, I mean, what was that like? It's hard to explain if you've not experienced it. It's easy for someone who has actually been there because it's a different dimension of life. Okay. Um, from a standard of living to the way life is out there. A combination of monas monastic type of life uh, or way of life with, uh, with education. But the twist of all it is uh, you are sent there for a year. Yeah. So for one year you don't see your family. Exactly. And the, it was the first time I'd been away. And as you can imagine, because I hadn't been to a school, so for me that was uh, that was quite challenging. But also it was the, um, the the shock of my life, you know, having to having to go into this space where um, people use pen and paper, write magic on, it, and I just did not know how that worked. Um, from there to, to to getting to a point where you know, twelve months later, you leave a place where you can read and write. When do you think that moment was when you thought, do you know what, actually, I guess from not being able to read and write and do mm. things to the moment where you go, actually, beyond that, I'm actually pretty, well, really quite a smart guy. And, and there's a lot of potential for me. Like, that world opens up at some point. When, when was that? I've never thought I was a smart guy. And okay. I never, I don't think if I'm, a, I would never classify myself uh, as a smart guy because um, I think once you start thinking that you are smart, that's where things start decerating mm. because there's always that idea when you think you're smart, you know everything. So I've never considered myself as a smart guy. I've always considered the opportunities yeah. that are presented and when opportunities get presented, you just utilize them, you just take them. So just going back to your question, uh, when did I think I had the, the opportunity or at least had the capability yeah. of taking the same route as everybody else? Um, I think it was just whenever I would get the knowledge, I was just able to to, to grasp the knowledge. Yeah. Um, I didn't struggle and I don't struggle. If yeah. someone explained to me at the time something, I'll just pick it up very quickly. And yeah. your parents, very proud? Well, I lost my dad when I was oh, very, very, very young. I think I was two years old. Um, my mother, is a, she's an English teacher. Um, she's never said I've done well. I've never heard the word you've done well. <laughs> parents are good at so like holding I'm back still, on I'm still working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all the work I'm putting in is so that one day she can say, yeah, yeah, you've done well. But up till now, no, she, says, she still it's thinks that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she still thinks there's a lot to be done. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to speak to her, she said, no, no, it is, he hasn't achieved anything. He needs, to, he needs to try and work harder. Wow. Yeah. So first of all, you joined the Hook Group in 2012, so that was yeah. quite early in the kind of Hook Group days, really. So what did the Hook Group look like when you joined? What was it? Oh, wow. Um, so I joined the Hook Group. So this is the time we were in um, uh, Northwich, Gabriel yeah. Park, and we were sharing a building with an, um, Nationwide. I was the, I think, the 36th employee wow. for the company. So you can imagine the, the, the size of the company were very, very small. I joined a, uh, a team called Checkout, so we were building our proprietary checkout platform. Before then, we were using WorldPay. We were a team of about four engineers, mm -hmm. uh, I think five including myself. And now we are, I think with the buildings we've got, I think we've got the Icon, Media City, Nor uh, Northwich. Um, if we bring in tech people because of working remotely, I don't think it will fit in any of the buildings. Wow. That's how much we've grown. Amazing, yeah. right? And I've been, you know, I've been around to see, I've been privileged to be around to see every bit of growth. And how did you progress in your career? Was it, you know, who sponsored you, and how did you kind of climb the ladder to now be leading the sort of the engineering team, really? Um, it sponsored me in terms of uh, of mentorship. Yeah, who kind of picked you out when this is a star? Oh wow, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I'm not sure if some. Okay, so there are two sides of this. I think with me, my career as a software engineer. Um, progress in 2015 when mm. I was with the company and we got a new CTO who is still a group CTO um, when he came in I think for me I looked up to him you know I, I saw the changes he brought into the company I saw that his drive his passion about tech and for me it was like I want to be like him one day I'm not saying it's gonna be anytime soon and I think from then I think that's how my career progress and I would say probably changed because you had someone to look up to. I'm not saying that he probably spotted me and say he's the, he's a star, but I think it was the other way around, me spotting someone ahead of me. So it sounds like you had the you wanted it, you would have the drive, right, to, to progress. 
Yeah, I don't think if I had someone who said, I'll push you, I'll give you these opportunities. Yeah. No, it was more me pushing through the mental barriers and pushing through um, different obstacles. But at the same time, having that support. There are two things with what we do, and I think it's with every career. You can be in a very good company, but if there are no opportunities, then you, know, you, you won't progress. And there could be opportunities, uh, but also you need opportunities and support. And I think um, I've been very, very privileged and very lucky to have both. Yeah, fast forward to your role now. You're, yeah. you're leading a, you know, one of the most important teams, I suggest, mm. in the organization. How does the company think about tech now? Is it still a core part of the DNA of the business? Or? Oh, absolutely. Um, so THG, uh, we, we, we consider ourselves as a technical company. Mm. We're a tech company. I can't speak for the, you know, for the hair management, but I think we will always, be, we will always drive tech. Tech yeah. is the... Uh, the backbone of, of what we do. Looking at different divisions, um, we see from the top that tech is given really high priority. I think we're in a position where we compete with with IA giant tech companies. You're in a role now where you're, I guess, you know, leading a group and mentoring a lot of people. Yeah. You, you've had like this amazing, let's call it, social mobility story. You know, as, as actually, you know, myself, I've been in the same kind of position in terms mm. of, you know, my social uh, mobility has been fantastic. What are you doing today to help other people through that situation? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I was asked the same question with a few people and uh, I always sort of change the, 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 the question. I always say, I think the, the measure of success for any leader is seeing how he brings his people up or mm -hmm. at least people he works with. So sorry, I've just twisted your, your, no, your no, question. <laughs> so for me, um, the way I would say I'm succeeding in my role, I've worked with people, they've walked in, they're graduates, they've got maybe struggling with, with tech, understanding the tech from, from the tech itself to the confidence of saying, you know, I can take this project on and I can deliver to seeing an individual becoming a team lead you can see that they would go into meetings, they would hold meetings very well, they'll architecture solutions. When I see that progress and I see that improvement on people and what they are achieving out of that, to me, I can sit back and say, yeah, um, I think I'm, I'm succeeding. That's yeah. So to me, my success is really affecting the people I, I, at least I work with. What's next? What's your, what, do you want to, what do you want to achieve? I think in my journey, in my career, I think I'm, if it's a measure of 1 to 10, I'm probably on 1.5. <laughs> <laughs> Just the beginning then. Just the beginning. Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm right at the beginning. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is, like I said, I, I work with really fantastic people. Mm. I look at you know, the, the group CTO, the current group CTO, and look at what he knows and the things he does and the drive. and. The, the passion he's got to his, his people he works with. Um, I also look at you know, other areas of tech. And I compare, I look at myself and I think that, yeah, I'm very, very, at the very early beginning of the journey. We meet a lot of startups, right? And yeah. one of their big, big challenges is how they hire their, their engineering team, of how course, they yeah. motivate them, how they kind of keep them, mm. and, and how they upskill their own team. Yeah. What advice would you give to startups that are trying to build their their engineering team out? That's a very good question. I'll probably answer that based on the experience I've had mm. and, and seeing, um, and the example I can give is, is THG because I joined the company when we were fairly, very, very new, at least in tech. Yeah. And in tech, we progressed very fast in 2015 um, when we had the new, the, the, new uh, the, the group CTO. And I think one of the things he did, which was quite huge, it had a huge impact, is looking after the people. Because now tech is quite, demanding and you've got very few people yeah. in tech, the best way you can grow your tech platform and have the best people, best look after, you know, look after your engineers. Um, and I don't mean look after engineers by throwing them a lot of pay rise and all that, yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. more around understanding what really motivates individuals. Um, we've got really good management and leadership where you can be on a day where you're almost about to give up and you will get an email from the group CTO saying, thank you very much for that. Mm. And it's like you've been battery charged for the, <laughs> <laughs> for the next You're three off. months. And it's not that someone has thrown you a big bonus and says, you know, and I think this is where tech companies go wrong. I think they throw in a lot of bonuses and a lot of big packages and hopefully thinking that they would keep the engineers. But sometimes it's what really works for an individual. And sometimes just a word of thank you can go a long way. 
is there a moment in that whole THD journey and you've seen, you know, a lot of different things happen, you know, I guess there was that kind of scale up, there's been a whole journey around the IPO and the, mm. the challenges. What's your take on it? What went well, what went wrong? What would what would you see done differently, if anything? If we look at the the, 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 the top management to get the company to where they are, it is now, we can look at the succession, how the company has mm. succeeded. It takes a lot to get the company to where it is now. It, it's, it's a phenomenal work that the person has done. What has gone wrong, I, in my where I stand, nothing has gone wrong because we see from an inside and we mm. see how tech we progress inside. And I can talk from a tech standpoint yeah, and I look at the past, right? So if we just go back six months, where we are now and going back six months, it's not what we're doing six months, not what, what we're doing now. Yeah. And it's very rare to find companies like that. Yeah. We move very, very fast. We change a lot faster than yeah. I've worked for about eight companies in my career. And this is the only company I've been with where the changes are dramatic and mm. we, we, we work very, very fast. So based on that, I don't think if um, my comment is there's nothing that is going wrong. Right. I think everything that is being done, everything that we do internally, I think it's, it's the right decision people are making. Yeah. And I think one of the decisions that is being taken is, you know, putting tech forward yeah. as, as, as a priority. And I think that's of, as a, where I stand is working very well. Yeah. Yeah. Is the UK a great place to build a tech business? It's got its own challenges. Mm. It's got its own challenges. Um, of course, with Brexit, Brexit hasn't helped us. Yeah. Not that I'm, you know, I stand nowhere with Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally That's never neutral. Done that <laughs> but of course, the, po the point we're trying to make is, of course, it's brought in its own challenges in mm. terms of software engineers. If you were to move a company and say you would start a company in America, it will have its own challenges. Anywhere you start a tech company, it will have its own challenges. Yeah. Is UK the best place to run a tech company? Um, I think the answer is yes, mm. because we are seeing company, we are seeing tech companies taking off very, very well in the UK. And then you've got famous universities. That's another thing. It's, it's a good catchment area because mm. um, I was studying in South Africa and my dream was to come and see baby one and baby two in Manchester University, which yeah. were the first computers in the world to be yeah, built. Yeah. So you've got that attraction. So you do have people. Yeah coming to the UK to study. And that's where you'd always get that opportunity to get the right people. And then you have got people in the UK who are now changing the trajectory quite hard and going into, into tech. And the proudest thing you've achieved in your career? Not sure if I've achieved it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was once I was working on a project which was almost impossible to launch. Mm. Um, had deadlines, we were working with a client who knew what they wanted and there yeah. was no cutting corners or anything. Oh, okay. And of course, with, uh, with our group CTO, he's very strict with making sure we're doing the right thing. Um, so the project was quite challenging about being able to launch a project um, within the dates that were set. Granted, I spent an entire week sleeping on the you know, office floor <laughs> <laughs> to get this project going. I think that was probably when we launched that new pro that, the platform yeah. to me. That was my proudest moment. Yeah. And that was... 2017. But since then, I've not had a problem. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> so, Basil, you know, incredible career. Do you think you've reached your summer? Are you on the way there? Do you know what your summit looks like? Oh, my summit, to say that I've reached my summit is if I could be, if I could get to a point where at least I do half of the person I look up to, mm. um, I would say I would have, have, have achieved my summit, I think. Uh, right now, I'm probably doing. 0.1% uh, of what he does. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, I think if I, I can do half of what the group CTO is doing or is capable of doing uh, and what he's done for THG Tech, I think that would be my summit. At least that's, a, that's how I would, uh, you know, I'll picture it. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks, Basil. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, what a journey from Tanzania to Manchester. Yeah. Um, and you know, we, we're very glad that you're part of the Northern contingent now in, in the UK. Very proud. It's something we believe a lot in. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you enjoyed the podcast, please like it, leave a comment and also get in touch. We'd love to hear from you around the sorts of guests that you'd uh, find inspiring on our future podcasts. Thanks a lot for listening.